Uh, good evening um, and welcome to all uh, of you who are interested uh, in this uh, very topical uh, uh, series of presentations tonight, which is about the modeling uh, uh, efforts that really help uh, understanding and, and support the uh, public health uh, decision making during this pandemic. And this evening we have a, a, an important cast of characters to, uh, to shed some light on how that process is done, but particularly also what the uncertainties are and how that is being handled. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a, a brief uh, series of messages. If you have questions for the speakers, please uh, enter them in the uh, Q&A um, uh, chat. Uh, indicating who you are addressing your questions to. Keep them short so that we can handle uh, several of them. And some of them will be uh, explained or answered, addressed uh, by the, the presenters, and then they will also remain visible. Uh, and for you, those of you who will be watching this uh, through YouTube, unfortunately, that option is not there. Um, so that's the, just the preamble. Uh, and uh, with that, let me just without further ado, introduce the first um, uh, panelist, that's Professor uh, Mark Bonton. He is an infectious disease uh, professor in, at Julius Center and the University Medical Center of Utrecht. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Yes, let me try to share my screen. Can you say, see my screen? Yeah. Yes. So I will only give a very brief introduction as I'm looking uh, as forward as you probably do to uh, the presentations to come. The title of this uh, webinar is Modeling of Uncertainties and especially with a special interest now, of course, in the rise of Omicron. I don't think that there could have been a more timely day to have this webinar. This was one of the um, newspapers uh, this morning opening with the new lockdown as being an emergency break. And as you're probably familiar with, is that the decision to do this, to let's say to implement this lockdown was almost exclusively based on model predictions. So therefore I think it's very good that we hear from the true experts, how certain or uncertain these model predictions are. I am by training a medical doctor and a uh, internist infectious disease specialist and later became a clinical microbiologist. So I am not at all a modeler. Yet I became fascinated by mathematical modeling already, let's say 25 years ago when I did a course in Oxford, where at that time, one of the speakers of today was a, I think a very young staff member of the department and infectious disease of humans and the dynamics and control, let's say, have been brought to attention of many by this book by Roy Anderson and Bob May. And for clinicians, it's sometimes difficult to understand, but enough is understandable to have opinions on modeling. So what clinicians usually say is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I am a clinical trialist more. And then I say, well, we know that most studies are wrong, but some are useful. And the combination of the two means that usually I think if model predictions are not confirmed by study results, the immediate question is where did the study go wrong? Because models are always correct. The only thing that can go wrong are the assumptions. So the COVID pandemic has made us all a kind of mathematical modelers of infectious diseases. I think even the, the lay public now is familiar probably with SIR modeling certainly with that there are dynamics that you can calculate through differential equations. I think the whole population now knows what a reproductive number is and are not or an effective reproduction number. And even many know what an incubation period or a serial interval is. All these aspects are critical in the use of mathematical modeling in order to, let's say, predict what will be coming next in a pandemic or in an outbreak. Also very important is, as we have learned through, through this pandemic, who contacts who. So who is in contact, who at schools, at work, at the, let's say, the differences between generations. And all these things have been studied before, 
and are now, let's say, brought to real life in science and in communication about science and informing politicians and policymakers on a daily basis. So the goal of infection control in terms of mathematical modeling is very, very simple. Bring down something with a basic reproductive number above one to an effective reproduction number below one and keep it there. Well, real life is a little bit more difficult than that, as we all know, but this is basically what is intended. When COVID started, let's say January, February 2020, the first model papers appeared very rapidly. This was one, again, by Roy Anderson, but with collaboration from some of our Dutch colleagues, which appeared online on March 6. This was the first, before the first lockdown activities in many countries in Europe. And this already explained what would happen. We would have in red an epidemic growth with a very fast doubling time at that time. There would be a big wave and the efforts should be made to control that first wave. And then we would have let secondary waves each time that we would relax measures until uh, sufficient immunity would have been built up in the community. This was on March 6. This paper from one of our speakers today was very, very influential in the United Kingdom. It was on March 16, and it predicted what would happen without control measures in the country. And actually, as I say, was very informative for the government to implement measure either to suppress or to mitigate what was coming. At that time, it was also, again, as in the previous paper, but now with more specific numbers for the population predicted what would happen during the first wave, what measures should be implemented in order to bring down the number of hospitalization and intensive care admissions uh, to levels that could be handled, and also what would happen in the future, that there would be blocks of control measures or lockdown periods each time that uh, after some time that relaxations were implemented in order to control the further rises of the pandemic as long as that we would have sufficient immunity, hopefully through humanization by vaccination or either through uh, survived infections. And this is more or less typically, at least to some extent, what we have seen until today. These aspects became very popular when someone termed this the hammer and the dance, which was, let's say, nothing really new for those that were into mathematical modeling or infectious disease modeling, but became very popular with the lay public. And, and actually these are just the, uh, the signals that had already been shown in many previous models. So I'm very much looking forward to today's uh, presenters uh, that you can see here. And I'm also looking forward to the panel discussion that we can have at the end, because if something is certain for modeling is that there will be many questions many opinions and many debates on the value of these models and the role that they have played so far in this pandemic. With that, uh, Mayom, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Mark. And also uh, questions for Mark can be uh, put in the Q&A. And we uh, move on directly with uh, Professor Michael Edelstein, um, I hope, he joined us. Fine. Yes, I see you. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, who is a professor of infectious diseases and vaccine epidemiology, who, uh, when uh, we invited him, said immediately, I'm not a modeler, <laughs> uh, but uh, we are very interested to hear your experience and your uh, analysis of the vaccine uh, response and the vaccine program uh, in Israel, which of course uh, is something that the world has, uh, has learned a lot from. So uh, Michael, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Marion. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, okay. Is this okay? Can you see? Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, as you said, I'm I'm not a modeler, so um, I'm certainly not a card carrying modeler. Um, but as a, as a public health professional and, and an epidemiologist, um, I end up collecting a lot of the the data that is then used as assumptions for models. And what I'm hoping to do is uh, through the through description of the um, 
the response and the, the response of the pandemic in Israel is try to illustrate some of the some of the challenges in uh, in collecting these is these assumptions. So um, just very quickly, because these are actually incredibly important when it comes to anticipating the spread of disease, a very quick comparison uh, between Israel and the Netherlands, uh, both relatively small countries with a very similar uh, population density, a quite high, high population density within uh, European standards, but a very different uh, age distribution with um, <clears throat> Israel having a very young population, much closer to what you expect in low and middle income countries over a quarter of the population below the age of 15. Um, both uh, high income countries, both countries that through the routine program are well, well accustomed to delivering and accepting uh, vaccination. Uh, and despite of their differences ended up with uh, relatively similar COVID incidents and relatively similar um, vaccine coverage. So in, interesting, uh, interesting remarks. <clears throat> Israel is a, is a tiny country with very distinct populations. Um, and you, you may all have your own um, perception about what Israel looks like. It actually, it's almost like several countries in one with uh, a, a secular Jewish population, a religious, popu a religious Jewish population, and an Arab population that um, have very different lifestyles, geographically live in different places, uh, with some level of uh, mixing, but uh, but not that much. Which means that when it comes to um, you know using these data to try and anticipate how disease spread and who I think Mark showed a graph about who who spreads to who, you need to take these in consideration in, in your models, and that's really hard because the data doesn't. Uh, necessarily exist in ways that that can be used. Um, here's what the uh, the epidemiological curve looks like for uh, Israel versus uh, the Netherlands, and and I put the UK because I know we have a speaker from the UK as well. So um, I want to just go back to the very beginning of uh, of the pandemic in the early twenty in early twenty twenty, and what we see is a relative relatively similar uh, shape and magnitude of uh, of the first wave. Uh, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, incidents per, per population. And then what happened in Israel was after very strict uh, measures to limit the spread and almost overnight uh, opening up of these measures, which led to an early and quite big uh, second wave and uh, another lockdown and, uh, and then a third wave. And at the, at the peak of the third wave, the uh, vaccination efforts started. And the vaccination efforts in Israel was both earlier and quicker than most countries. And we saw a rapid uh, decline in incidence and actually a, um, a period very briefly uh, around, around June 2021 where, um, where the transmission went down to zero. There were, I think, for three days, no new cases reported. And the surveillance system is relatively robust. Um, and, and around that time, the first imported case of uh, Delta was confirmed in, in early July. And, and this is despite very, very strict travel bans. Um, and despite high vaccine coverage at that point, um, the, the incidence uh, went up very quickly. Delta spread very quickly and became the dominant, spray, uh, the dominant strain within, uh, within weeks. And, uh, and at that point, data started coming out from Israel mainly, but also from the UK, uh, about waning of, uh, of the priming. Well, at the time, it wasn't the priming. It was, it was intended as the whole course, uh, but waning of, uh, of vaccination. And Israel took the decision to, um, to boost quite widely and quite rapidly again, um, probably a little bit too late to avoid the fourth wave, uh, which, but then that, that wave uh, subsequently um, subsided. And then um, we entered the eight, late, late November, entered the uh, sort of Omicron phase. And this is really interesting because we've we actually haven't seen um, a big rise, even though um, we're, the, the country's planning for a big rise purely based on modeling, not based on actual incidents yet. Um, but the, 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 epidemiology, the epidemiology at the moment looks very different. It probably won't for very long, but um, at, towards the end of my presentation, I'd like to think about why that might be. Um, the 
The mortality, though, is uh, looks very different. And this is interesting, and I particularly want to um, bring your attention to the first peak in, uh, in early 2020, because whereas uh, both the UK and the Netherlands um, saw quite large peaks of mortality, which were later attributed mainly to deaths in nursing homes, Israel saw very little mortality. And this is not just due to um, a difference in the age distribution, but also to the fact that nursing homes are very rare in, in Israel. Um, elderly people tend to be um, looked after in, in, in a family setting. So um, again, these are, you know, these are important things to take in consideration when you, if you want to model the spread of disease because the uh, potential for spread in an elderly population is very different uh, in, a, in a nursing home setting than in a home setting. And th these are data that are um, actually very hard to, to, uh, to get your hands on because often they don't exist beyond uh, you know, anecdot anecdotal or, or, or local data. So, um, so you know, the, these, are, these are important factors to take in consideration. Um, I want to run a little bit more in detail in the different, uh, different phases very quickly. So the, um, in the first wave, Israel um, implemented some of the most restrictive measures very early on with uh, a national state of emergency, an almost complete uh, ban on flights, co a complete lockdown where people were not allowed to go more than uh, 100 meters from their house, uh, masks uh, outdoors at the time where WHO was not recommending masks uh, and uh, roadblocks to prevent people from going from one place to another. Uh, at the time, it was both nationally and internationally um, sort of uh, described as completely over the top. Uh, but it, as, as a result, we ended up with a very short and very small wave. So uh, that was uh, a time where Israel was um, sort of described as a, as a, a beacon and, and, and a model to follow. Uh, within a matter of days, they completely reversed that. And we went from um, epidemiologically a very uh, good situation to a very bad situation with a very rapid in increase in incidence uh, from one of the lowest to one of the highest incidence per capita in the world. Uh, seeing pressures on the healthcare system uh, quite similar to European, most European countries, not, not like Italy, but, but others. Um, then uh, at the peak of the second wave, uh, school closed quite early and uh, learning moved online. There were quite strictly enforced restrictions on, on gatherings. Uh, and despite that, the incidence became, became the highest per capita in the world at the end of 2020. Uh, prompting another lockdown and a gradual reopening uh, about two months later. Then uh, the alpha variant uh, was introduced with, uh, again, very strict criteria for uh, uh, exit and entry into the country, which uh, are still by and large in place. Uh, a third lockdown and the rapid mass vaccination took place uh, during that uh, third lockdown pretty much. Um, and as I said, that, that decreased quickly. And then the D Delta variant was uh, introduced, well, it was imported roughly at the same time that uh, waning of, uh, of, of the primary course was noticed. So uh, a widespread boosting policy came into place, which uh, and now about 7 million out of 9 million people have received uh, a booster. And now we're in this in the in this uh, in this phase where we are anticipating a fifth wave. The, despite very few cases, there's a total, almost a total closure on uh, on travel. Israelis cannot leave. No non-citizens can return. If uh, if you are out of the country and return, you have to quarantine in a hotel in a quarantine hotel, regardless of vaccination status. Uh, and there's a push to, for boosting um, those who are not yet boosted and talks of a fourth dose for uh, the most vulnerable individuals. I want to talk a little bit about vaccination because uh, Israel was um, seen as a, you know, the model to follow for vaccination early on. And what's remarkable here is not, not the vaccine coverage, which is now you know, lower than the Netherlands, but this, the, if you look at the shape of the curve, it's very different. And we now, we now understanding and for modeling, it's, it's very important for, for, for uh, programmatic purposes, it's also very important that unlike most of the vaccines we deal with, um, the, the coverage is not 
the only thing important, the, the timing is also important. In other words, it's not just if you are vaccinated, but when you were vaccinated. And uh, obviously we're seeing this uh, with, uh, the, with, with boosting as well, with a very, uh, a very similar situation. Israel started boosting when boosting was not popular, was uh, actually um, not recommended by WHO. Israel was criticized. Um, but, uh, you know, gradually waning became clearer and clearer and more and more countries adopted uh, boosting, not to the extent where, uh, not to the extent that, that Israel does, which is basically opened, opened up boosting to all, um, to all age groups, except the 5 to 11, uh, because they've just become available, uh, eligible for, for priming vaccination. And uh, this is being... Um, uh, exacerbated by Omicron with, with uh, early evidence suggesting that um, although the protection uh, from uh, two doses is limited, the, pr the, the protection from a, a recent booster is, is quite good in terms of decreasing the risk of hospitalization and severe outcomes. So th there's pros and cons to, to, this, to, this, uh, to this shape curve because even though you're reaching, uh, you're reaching um, immunity, you, you're reaching cover, uh, high coverage relatively quickly, you also, we know that uh, immunity wanes quite quickly, so you also know that, uh, um, you know, the, 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 immu the population immunity will decrease, we don't exactly know when for, 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 for boosters yet, but it, it becomes, and, and, and I'd, be, I'd love to hear uh, the other panelists about how you model this, but it becomes a game between the, 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 the timing of vaccination versus uh, the timing of the introduction and the spread of different variants. And, and that, I think, introduces a, a layer of, of a, a level of complexity that we haven't seen before, because vaccination is no longer a binary variable. It's, uh, it's a time sensitive variable. And, uh, and programmatically, which is really, you know, my, my area, it becomes very complex to decide when to boost and you have to, you have to balance early benefits versus uh, knowing that uh, the, the, the long-term benefits will, will, will decrease. So Israel was uh, successful with vaccination for several reasons. First of all, there was the, uh, the famous or infamous deal between the country and Pfizer, which means that availability has never really been an issue. Uh, we're a very small country with a very concentrated population, which means that logistically um, it's quite easy to distribute um, and also to access uh, vaccines because most, uh, not actually all, pretty much all municipalities have a health center where you can get vaccinated. There was clear and tailored communication, tailored by uh, age, uh, tailored by language, tailored by ethnicity. So depending on where you were, you saw very different messages in different languages. There was actually a government effort to suppress and criminalize anti-vaccination uh, messaging and behavior, which was highly successful. Um, there's also an experience of managing uh, emergency with high level coordination between different um, state institution, different ministries, etc., mainly related to the security situation, but meaning there's a precedent for uh, deploying these kind of uh, countrywide command and control type structures. There's a centralized uh, healthcare system, which makes things easier in terms of monitoring and delivering and also very high um, data quality, which means that in real time, you know exactly who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated and where they are. Um, this is the latest data on vaccine coverage. You can see that among the um, older age groups, uh, two dose vaccine coverage is very high as over, 80, over 85% for most groups. Uh, boosting coverage is over 80% for the older age groups but a younger age groups are not as well vaccinated, both in terms of priming and in terms of uh, boosting. So there's about, about one and a half to two million people who are not either not boosted or not vaccinated at all. And it's not clear whether that makes it, uh, you know, how that will impact on Omicron. So there's a push to, um, to vaccinate, um, you know, what's in, a, in the classical adoption and innovation curve, what you would call laggards, because, now in Israel, really anyone who wants to be vaccinated can get vaccinated. You can, you can book uh, same day appointments. You don't even need to book appointments. You can, you can turn up anywhere. And I, 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 this is the case in most, uh, most Euro Euro European countries. 
yet there's still a significant proportion of the population that is either not vaccinated or under vaccinated. And, you know, understanding how that impacts on the spread of Omicron um, is a question that remains to be answered. So who remains unvaccinated? I just want to share a couple of studies that my team has done. Uh, this is looking at uh, vaccine coverage by age group and by ethnicity. And what's interesting here is not that, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, minorities are under vaccinated because this is a classic phenomenon, but it's that the, the effect and the difference actually changes according to age. And what we see is a generational effect with a certain group, particularly the ultra-Orthodox Jewish group, diverging from their age peers the younger you get. So if you look at the uh, older individuals, the difference is relatively small, and the, 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 the younger you get, the bigger the difference is. And this is a concern for childhood vaccination because uh, the, um, the, least, the, the least likely to vaccinate are young ultra-Orthodox uh, individuals who are also parents of the largest number of children. The average number of, of children in this age group, in this, uh, sorry, in this population group is about five to six children per family. So uh, potentially uh, in, 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 the, in the future, uh, you seeing um, a, a large under-vaccinated or unvaccinated group. And we can actually see this. This is a, this is really a, on, an ongoing analysis that looks at the correlation between vaccinate, vaccine coverage in um, in uh, twenty to thirty nine year olds, so people who are sort of young parents, with um, with five to eleven year old, which is a group that started being vaccinated about three three to four weeks ago. And what you see is that in the in the general Jewish population, you see a clear correlation. Uh, and this, sorry, each, each, each data point is a municipality. And you can do this in Israel because the, the municipality are largely distinct. There are relatively few places where the population is mixed. So in, in secular Jewish uh, municipalities, you see that the higher the coverage in, um, in adults, in parents, the higher the coverage in children. So in other words, vaccinated parents are vaccinating their children. But in, uh, in Arab and ultra-Orthodox towns, you don't see that effect. And if you look at the line of best fit, it's, it's, it's almost flat, meaning that regardless of what, um, what parents did, they're not, vaccinated, they're, they're not vaccinating their children, uh, which, you know, again, doesn't bode well for these particular, uh, these particular uh, localities in terms of the spread of uh, the virus. And, and when it comes to predictions and modeling in Israel, uh, really, you cannot you cannot average these. They're really distinct populations, and these need to be taken into consideration. Um, so, just to finish briefly, um, COVID is really with us for is going to be with us for some time. And you know, every time you every time we think we're done, we're not done. There's always a surprise around the corner, and it's almost like it's almost like a new a new pandemic each time. And uh, and the data with Omicron is, is, is reassuring in some ways in terms of the early data around severity, but also quite worrying in terms of the absolute number of cases we're likely to see. Um, vaccines are clearly not a magic bullet, even in highly, and we're seeing this both in highly, even in highly vaccinated countries, because the, the, the virus is um, outpacing us in many, many ways. We're also learning that being, it's not enough knowing if you're vaccinated, but you really need to start thinking about the, the, the timing of uh, vaccination at the individual and at the population level, and the interval between timing and, and between priming and boosting. Um, and there's still a lot of uh, unknowns about optimal timing, what and, and what is going to be the impact of vaccination on, uh, on Omicron. I just want to finish with uh, with the, the, the same graph that we saw early on, and I want to focus on the end and trying to think about the difference between uh, Israel and the UK or, or the Netherlands at this point in time, uh, particularly with the UK, because uh, you know, especially in London, the um, you know the, the the incidence is rising extremely fast, and if you think about the differences, there are quite a few. The age distribution is different. The age-specific vaccine coverage and boosting is different. Uh, the vaccination timeline is different. Israel vaccinated earlier and boosted earlier. The type of vaccine is different. Uh, the, um, the travel situation is different. The Israel banned 
uh, travel almost as soon as uh, the first Omicron case was reported. There was never an interruption in uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions in Israel, apart for about three days in, in June. But essentially, I was quite shocked when I came to Europe to see how many people are not wearing masks. I didn't realize that not everyone was still wearing masks outdoors in shopping centers, etc. And we have uh, vaccination passes everywhere, everywhere you go. So when it comes to um, trying to explain the differences, disentangling the different effects and the relative contribution uh, of these different elements to explain differences between countries or even within countries uh, becomes extremely complex. And I, I'm, I would, I'm really looking forward to the next um, two talks to hopefully um, shed some light on how you, how you deal with uh, such a level of complexity. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say one last thing, which is just a remark. It's not a scientific remark. It's a very empirical remark. And this is that if you look at uh, different countries, and here I've put five countries, um, countries with very different policies, different uh, introduction of vaccinations, different vaccines, different travel policies, et cetera, et cetera, very different dates of lockdowns, there really isn't any country that's, that stands out. Um, you know, and this is really something that surprises me, and it just makes me wonder to what extent, uh, you know, to what extent the the these measures actually uh, make a difference, and to really understand and to unpick each of these, um, it, it's really it's really mind boggling. And I'm uh, again, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more from uh, from my two colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for this uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, talk and, and remarks. Um, and I think uh, certainly your last remark really resonates because we have a lot of this uh, finger pointing. This is much better. That is much better. But uh, like you, I think we haven't seen the end of this yet. And it's really going to be important to try and see what we can learn uh, here. We will take questions uh, uh, after everyone's uh, uh, talks at the panel, okay? So I will uh, continue by introducing uh, uh, Jaco Wallinga, <coughs> who is the Professor of uh, Modeling uh, uh, of Infectious Diseases at the Leiden University Medical Center, but he, who is also the head of the modeling group at the National Institute of Public Health. Uh, and uh, has been uh, working a lot with uh, many of the uncertainties that uh, that uh, really uh, the modeling community has had to deal with. So Jaco, please um, take the floor. So uh, thank you, Marion, for uh, the introduction. I think, um, like some of my presentation is blacked out. I hope this disappears. Um, like the, I would like to talk a little bit about modeling the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the Netherlands and emphasizing the uncertainties that we face. And of course, it's not only kind of me who does the modeling, it's an entire team. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, uh, just to talk about the team uh, at the RFM. Um, we've been modeling the spread and control of infectious diseases for like quite a long uh, time now. And some people may wonder what we did before there was uh, a pandemic. And mainly we developed methods uh, to assist in controlling emerging epidemics and outbreaks. Um, like one of the motivators for this work was the SARS outbreak in 2003. Um, we also spent our time in assessing costs and effects of infectious disease control, um, and a major part of that is the evaluation of um, vaccination programs. So basically, we were reading uh, scientific papers and that, and writing um, books and scientific papers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. The, and then um, I think we skipped one uh, slide. So if we can go one back. Thank you. The, um, uh, like when the pandemic started in 2020, there was an article in Science, which I copied on the left, 
that basically stated that um, like one of the things that's happening now is that there's a kind of high stakes reality check to all the modeling that we are doing. And that's the way it felt. It was an unprecedented level of um, pressure. And basically what we do during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think this holds for a lot of other modeling teams is um, kind of statistical learning from incoming data. We are learning all the time. Um, and that involves conducting scenario analysis, making projections, and then informing all the relevant platforms uh, for decision making, and also explaining our work to the media and uh, the public. And uh, as I just stated, it comes at an unprecedented level of attention and pressure. And uh, just to make uh, sure uh, that our role in the decision process is really to um, take the incoming data, to analyze it, make models, inform um, the platforms such as the outbreak management team, and that is turned into a policy decision. Our role is that very much of like an advisor, not of a policy maker. And of course, like all the work we do, um, we don't do it just alone. We work with other public health institutes in Europe, academic institutions. We are part of an EU, of EU projects that focus on um, COVID-19. There's a WHO modeling network, uh, like we did projects with WHO uh, Europe and ECDC. Next slide, please. And like what I said before, like what we're doing is a kind of learning from incoming data. And I think what the role of modeling is, is um, that of combining the information from various data streams. And here on the left, you see um, a figure that shows for the Netherlands, the, number of hospitalizations in red, the number of um, ICU admissions in uh, blue, and the number of uh, deaths that were registered um, in yellow, and in gray, the number of positive cases. Like this is, these are kind of the events uh, of which we record and collect just the numbers and the timing. So we wanna know the symptom onset of cases, like whether they have a positive test uh, when they are admitted to hospital, we wanna know when, when they are admitted to the ICU, we also want to know like when they enter there. And of course, we also want to know if they uh, pass away or if they recover. And uh, in addition to that, um, uh, like we analyze the proportions of the variants in selected samples. Um, so there's a lot of sequencing going on and like we analyze that data as well. And we extract lots of information on the duration of stay, uh, for example, in hospitals. Like that's important if we want to know um, how busy it's going to be. And uh, we also integrate the information on the vaccinations. Um, like we need to know which types of vaccines are being used, how many shots are being given and when. And we also need to know the efficacy against infection, uh, the efficacy against transmission, the efficacy against severe illness of all these um, vaccinations in the different age groups. And um, like as Michael already uh, mentioned, we also need to collect some information on population behavior, uh, like who is contacting whom. Um, like the self-reported number of contacts um, is something we collect. We also have data on mobility. So that's all, um, all kinds of information that we are um, taking in and using it to inform the models. Next slide, please. And um, the analysis and the modeling that's uh, going on has to address like new questions all the time. Like one of the questions we um, studied lately was uh, like whether we should vaccinate the very young uh, children, the five to 11 years old after the EMA has approved uh, vaccination. We uh, <coughs> are faced with new questions when we have unanticipated events such as the emergence of uh, new variants like the Omicron we are facing now. And uh, of course, there are changing circumstances. Like slowly, such as the willingness uh, to follow rules and guidelines because of fatigue um, in the population. And on the right, I sketched um, a very uh, a primitive process of um, the kind of iterative or adaptive strategy that we used to learn from modeling. Basically, on top, we start by um, using a model or a revised model, uh, including the data streams, we try to fit the model to these observations in the data stream. We make a prediction, and that's in a kind of very broad sense. Um, 
and then we confront these predictions with observations, see if it's a, the model makes any sense. And we continue this process whenever we have a new question, whenever there's new information coming in, and that's basically happening every week. So we circle around in this process. And one of the key elements in this process is like the uncertainty we have, like we don't know lots of things. And of course, like predictions never match observations precisely. So there's various kinds of uncertainty in, in play. And we try to reduce that as much as we can. And one of the yeah, major tricks we use is like combining multiple data streams. It's not enough to only know how many cases there are, but you want to know like how many of these end up in the hospitals, how long they will stay there, which variants did cause the infection and so on. And like, if necessary, we reduce uncertainty further by collecting different kinds of data. I've got an example of that coming later on in the presentation. And like wherever possible, of course, we quantify the uncertainty. That's like the easiest when it's a kind of statistical uncertainty, but it's always uh, like uh, some uh, elements remain that are completely unknown. And I think it's very important to acknowledge the remaining unknowns and the consequences of these. This is, I think, just as much a part of the modeling, like what does not go into it as uh, the model itself. Um, and these models are then used for uh, like tracking observations, now casting and forecasting. And uh, in the next slides, I can give an example of the tracking that we do. So when I say tracking, I basically mean it's kind of an estimation uh, based on incoming data. And uh, one of the things, um, one of the variables we track is the reproduction number by variant of concern. In the top left corner, I show a kind of histogram of the number of uh, new cases uh, by their time of symptom onset uh, over time in the Netherlands. This, um, uh, this graph starts at the 16th of November last year and ends on the 13th of December this year. And by the, the color of the of the bars, um, I indicate the variant which was, uh, with which people have been infected. So the blue uh, indicates people who were infected with a Wuhan type or a wild type strain. The red um, part of the curve is the people, reflects people who are infected by the alpha strain. There's also um, some people have been infected by other like beta and gamma, but then the green ones reflect people infected by the Delta strain, and now it's not visible yet, but there are people infected by Omicron as well. And of course, um, you see that these variants explain to a large extent what's going on with the epidemic curve whenever a new variant is spreading. You basically can see that it causes a new, um, uh, like a new wave. And this becomes much clearer when we uh, have a slightly different look. We kind of convert this um, epidemic curve uh, in the top left corner to the time uh, curves of um, the time series of the effective reproduction numbers. This is the bottom left graph. Like on the horizontal axis, it's again time from 16th of November last year until 13th of December this year. And on the vertical axis is the effective reproduction number colored by uh, the variant. So the blue line indicates the reproductive number. If we would have had the wild type, the Wuhan type all along, then the alpha variant uh, was introduced and you see that basically the effective reproduction number is just uh, a bit higher. And um, that is followed for quite a while. And then the Delta variant is introduced and when that picks up, you can see that again, the effective reproduction number is increased again. So we make with each uh, new variant that starts spreading, we make a jump in the effective reproduction number to higher values. And we would have uh, yeah, gotten rid of this um, new virus already if it was just the one type. Um, and yeah, on the right hand side, I just explained for those people who don't, do not know like that the effective reproduction number is the number of secondary cases infected by a case, basically. Uh, the next slide, um, if I can have that, uh, shows the, <clears throat> like uh, this picture in a slightly different way. This um, again, uh, gives on the horizontal axis, the time 
now the date of sampling of um, um, samples of the virus and on the vertical axis now the proportion of all the samples that are collected that are uh, due to a specific variant. Again, red is uh, uh, the color now for the alpha variants. Um, green is the color we use for the delta variants. And now to the right, you can see we extended the time axis a bit into the future. The purple indicates the Omicron variant. And um, the fitted curve is based uh, in part on observations in the Netherlands. Like an, when we try to quantify like what kind of jump we are making in the effective reproduction number, we can see that um, using like the data we have, that when we went from the Wuhan type to the alpha variant, we made a 35, 34%, uh, um, uh, we had a 34% increase in uh, reproduction number. When we then from, went from alpha to delta, there was a 51% uh, increase. And now the estimate is when we move to the Omicron variant, there's a 160% increase. So in total, it's uh, like, 2.6 times as much as before. And these estimates I have to indicate um, like depend on assuming that the mean generation interval is similar for all these variants. If that's not the case, then a shorter generation interval or a serial interval uh, gives a slightly lower reproduction number. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we use this, uh, this information to inform a transmission model. And that's an example of what I called before forecasting. Like uh, this um, figure that you see is um, like again on the horizontal axis time. Uh, this is time since the start of the pandemic in the Netherlands. Um, it starts in March uh, or February uh, 2020. The black dots indicate the number of ICU admissions that are registered per day in the Netherlands. And um, through that, we fit uh, our model. Uh, the fitted line is indicated by a red line here. And also we extend it a little bit into the future. And we see that because of this um, Omicron, we uh, can expect uh, like a increase um, in number of ICU admissions. Um, like here in the curves that I show just to make clear what I mean with a forecast and a scenario and a projection and a counterfactual. I indicated the red line represents the fit of the model and the like kind of band around it reflects the uncertainty in the parameter values. And uh, basically this is all conditional on the fit to the observed uh, number of ICU admissions we have per day. Um, so when we make projections, uh, we assume that the uh, measures are remaining the same here. And like we can check whether the model makes any sense by just comparing the projections against actual observations if the measures remain the same. Like we also make calculations which are illustrated here by the green and blue lines, like what would have happened if measures would have remained the same in the past, even though we intervened and changed them. Like we cannot really check uh, whether these predictions make any sense because um, these, um, events never materialized, um, but we can check whether the model makes sense by just extrapolating from the accuracy of the projections um, we make. And sometimes we also do scenario analysis, like then we look into the future and we ask the question like, what would happen if measures would change in the future? And um, like the like most important check whether that makes sense is to look at the causal structure of the model. Next slide, please. And like uh, I promised earlier to give an example of that, um, of the data collection that we do to reduce uncertainty. Like when we look at the model, we really wanna like find out whether uh, the infection process as we modeled it makes any sense. So we also collect information on the actual um, transmissions that occur in the, in the Netherlands. Like here we uh, have actual infections that are reported and we also ask people who are um, reported, whether they know who their infector is. And if the infector is also reported, we have a transmission pair and we can make plots like you see on the left-hand uh, side of this slide. Then you see um, on the left uh, column of um, this figure, um, like uh, 
the kind of tr transmission pairs where the infector is, an, is unvaccinated. On the right column, you see transmission pairs where the infector is fully vaccinated. On the top row, you see uh, infectees, like people who are infected, that are fully vaccinated. And on the bottom row, you see infectees, transmission pairs where the infectee is unvaccinated. And in each of these panels, um, we make little dots for the number of transmission pairs that we see um, based on the age of the uh, infector on the horizontal axis or the infectee on the vertical axis. So what we see here that is that in November 2021 in the Netherlands, most infections occurred among the younger children from zero to 11 years old who are not vaccinated because they're too young and they infect each other. We can also see that they infected their parents which are a bit older in the age category from 30 till 50. They can be unvaccinated or they can be vaccinated. And we also see quite a bit of transmission events among the fully vaccinated elderly people in the top right-hand side. And of course, when we look at these figures, we have to be very careful because there's underreporting. Not everybody who's infected will be reported. The major uh, determinant of the structure we see in this graph is the household. So that's kind of important. We also check this on uh, proxies of infection. This, these are self-reported number of social contacts we collect. We look at mobility trends, like to see if people leave their house and go to work and go to school. Like it's very important to realize that this is all indicating the past behavior and like whether that is captured in a model. Uh, the future behavior is uh, like unknown. Um, in scenario analysis, when we look into the future, we assume that they, behavior changes when the measures change, the people change in response um, to that. But of course, um, like over the longer term, people change also because of other reasons. And uh, there are behavior, behavioral science studies that focus on the intention and motivation of um, people. And if we would include these, we might extend the prediction horizons for behavior. But I think for the time being, it's very important to realize that there is a kind of prediction horizon on each model. Um, because behavior over the longer term is not captured properly. Um, next slide, please. So um, when it comes down to the modeling, there are quite a few things that we know, um, and these are indicated on the left. Um, so in the Netherlands, what we know at the, this moment, um, as we speak, there's very little available healthcare capacity. Hospitals have many patients with uh, the Delta variant still. We know that the rate of increase of the Omicron variant relative to the Delta variant is high. This is what I tried to show you earlier. We also know that um, that's from um, other studies that have been published in the UK, that protection against mild disease is lower when exposed to Omicron um, as compared to the Delta variant. And we know that the booster uh, vaccinations offer much better protection against Omicron than the two uh, vaccine doses um, do, or having had a previous infection months ago. So that's what we know. And then on the right, I indicated some um, elements where we're still a little bit in the dark. Um, like we don't know exactly in the Netherlands how many people will accept a booster vaccine when it's offered. Uh, we don't know what a generation interval or the serial interval is of the Omicron variant. I indicated that earlier on, that's kind of important if we want to interpret it properly, but we have to wait until that information comes in. We don't know that much about the severity of infection with the Omicron variant yet. And with the severity, I really mean the probability of hospitalization among un unvaccinated, uninfected individuals given their age and the background. That's very important to know all these Things we don't know that much yet about the vaccine efficacy against infection, against transmission, transmission and hospitalization yet. Um, and like also there, we have to be very specific, like which types of vaccines. And we don't know yet how long people will stay in the hospital uh, on admission. So that's quite a bit of important things are unknown. The last slide. Uh, next slide, please. Which will be... Uh, Okay, um, that's what I want to say. Like, it's very important to communicate these um, elements. So I think we spend a lot of uh, our time and also like our boss is spending a lot of his time on communicating like the system dynamics of um, this infectious um, disease and its control and the risks and uncertainties that pertain to that. 
And I think throughout what we found out, it's very important to always communicate like the context of um, whatever number we have. Like it's very important um, when we talk about, for example, the incidence of uh, ICU admissions, like to know what we are really talking about. Is this like an estimate based on the actual data or is it like a now cost? Is it something that we think is happening right now, but we don't know yet because the incoming data is not yet complete on the current date? Or is it the forecast is something that we predict? And, uh, or would it be counterfactual, like something that would have happened if we had not intervened? So in all these cases, also the um, communication of uncertainty is very different. Like when it's an estimate, we can communicate it as kind of um, a confidence um, uh, interval. Everybody's familiar with that. But when it's a counterfactual, it's really the story that matters. And I think it's also important to realize in what kind of setting we are talking. We are talking to policymakers, usually through kind of um, several fora. Uh, we have to talk to the public. Sometimes we have to um, also talk to people in court. And of course, like right now, we have to inform our colleagues. So um, in the next slide, basically, I would like to thank everyone for bearing with me and stressing again that this is not my own work, it's like teamwork and these are all the team members. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Jaco. Um, we see uh, quite a few questions popping up, so uh, uh, and we will get, we will pick some of them in the discussion, the panel discussion. Uh, moving right on uh, to uh, Neil Ferguson, who is a professor of mathematical biology of Imperial College, um, and who also said, I could stay five to 10 minutes longer if needed. So uh, that, that's great. Neil? Thanks, Marion. I'll just share my screen. Um, so I'll go quickly. Um, I'll give a little bit on, on what we've learned from Omicron in the UK towards the end of this presentation. Um, but this is a little bit of an introduction. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit basically about modeling and uncertainty and then focus really on what we've done on, on variants and vaccines. Um, so this is my friend and colleague, Stephen Riley, who has moved from Imperial College now to head um, analytics and modeling at the UK Health Security Agency. So the same role as Yako fulfills in the Netherlands. Um, in terms of what we try to do, I mean, and this is only one, as Jaco said, one particular aspect of, of infectious disease modeling, let's say mathematical epidemiology, in terms of real-time outbreak analytics, it's a, it's a challenging role um, because data is so limited. But I, I kind of divide it into two different aspects. One is, I would say, mechanistically or um, motivated analysis of, of data as it comes in. So simple things like, which are not that simple, estimating the incubation period of generation time of disease, estimating severity, which is not at all simple. We have much better tools now than we used to have, um, thanks to Yako and colleagues, estimating transmissibility or the effective reproduction number, and then pulling all those things together to give policymakers some sort of assessment of risk posed by, let's say, a new virus or a new variant of a virus. And then finally, and I'm looking backwards here, assessment of how effective interventions are. I'll come on to kind of estimated vaccine effectiveness a little bit later. And then we have the use of dynamical modeling, which is has been about really about a third of what we've done during this pandemic, which is um, really I mean, in a forward-looking sense. I mean, fitting to the past, and as Jaco said, trying to project the future. Uh, forecasting is in some sense the simple way of doing that and tend to only go a few weeks forward. You basically assume um, nothing changes in that interval. And then the more challenging thing is looking at intervention options and so-called counterfactuals. Um, and I like to see the, the diagram here just shows my kind of view being a modeler of modeling at the center of the universe, um, and um, but really how it can inform um, both preparedness and response to emerging infectious diseases. More generally, I mean, one benefit of, of mechanistic models or models which pull together data of many different types to have a, albeit 
oversimplified rep representation of, of the epidemiology of a system is they do synthesize a lot of data together, shown in blue on the left, um, about the disease, its natural history, and potentially evolution, what we know about the effectiveness of interventions, but also things about the population, demography, and contact patterns. And then we get out of that insight into basic mechanism um, in an epidemiological sense, estimates of parameters which are important. Occasionally, we might try and make predictions, but they're generally difficult, but also some information for policymakers to assess the potential impact of different interventions. So when we're talking about um, types of modeling, there's another take on it. I mean, you can think backwards in time and forwards in time. So retrospective is, is looking backwards and, and is generally much easier, well, relatively easier to do and more certain. The uncertainty is at least more limited and contained. And here we're trying to understand past trends in transmission, for instance. As I've already said, estimate parameters, retrospectively assess how effective different interventions are. And generally, I mean, given the politics of this pandemic, it is, this has been a less controversial area, albeit assessing the you know, severity of this virus and, and the effectiveness of interventions has had its um, controversial aspects or politically sensitive aspects. Prospectively, though, and, and this is one of the areas which is in some ways of most use to policymakers, um, we have a lot more uncertainty. I mean, predicting the future is difficult. And the simpler aspect is just doing those short-term projections. More complex is giving policymakers at a particular point in town time, in some sense, now casting of what the level of risk posed by a new situation is. Even more difficult is intrinsically, and I would say all of it's counterfactual, um, counterfactual scenario modeling of intervention options. And the reason I say it's always counterfactual, it's always never going to actually happen is because we model a range of simplified policy options with limited information often on quite how effective they are. But of course, with simplified timing, implementation, making assumptions about people's behavior. And of course, policymakers then go and do something slightly different. And so we never see the scenario we've modeled. And so for those who are motivated in that direction, it's very easy to criticize, but nevertheless, it's, it's intrinsically very valuable to policymakers, even if, and hopefully they do at this point, they understand that it's not a precise prediction of the future. It is in, intended to indicate, in slightly more than the quality of the sense, what the trade-offs are and the potential scale of the impact of different interventions are. And we've done lots of both sides. We published some of the first estimates of the severity of coronavirus, um, estimates of the effectiveness of non-pharmaceutical interventions, and have done lots of uh, work on the transmissibility of new variants. And we've also done um, work on the latter side, looking forwards in time. Um, it's already mentioned uh, work back in early in the pandemic on looking at you know, a strategic decision of whether to lock down or, or flatten the curve, but also generalizing that to a more global context and, and then work which really spans halfway between models just as the one Yako showed, which look back in time, fit to data, but then go forward and project the potential impact of interventions. Um, so giving a, a concrete example from the UK context of sort of counterfactual projections we were doing, this is going all the way back a year, more than a year ago, where, like every other country, most other countries in Europe, we were seeing an uptick in cases. This was prior to Alpha coming along. It was just down to um, lockdown measures being lifted. And whilst we had said back in March that this would be the inevitable consequence of lifting off lockdown measures, nevertheless, policymakers wanted a sense of what the potential impact of additional social distancing measures, somewhat short of the first lockdown, keeping schools open, but what might the effect be? They were also, in the UK context, rather concerned about could they relax measures over Christmas? They're not shown here. Um, and so here we looked at, we didn't attempt to predict exactly what um, the effect of the second lockdown would be. We had a, an estimate of it, um, but not a precise estimate. 
we show, depending on the level of infectiveness, effectiveness, the different colored curves, that would be the likely impact going forward. Um, and then we also looked at an additional scenario we anticipated, this is looking at daily deaths, that that would not be sufficient. I mean, going back to all that modeling back in March, that if you only intervene for a certain point of time before you have vaccine, then cases will resurge. We anticipated, and then of course, a January lockdown, which the UK did introduce, would be necessary after all. Of course, reality did not match that because then we had the alpha variant came, came along and made the situation considerably worse. So if the topic of this, this um, seminar is around modeling uncertainty, I, I mean, this is an entirely um, figurative, um, illustrative picture, but if you think of axes of time on the bottom, doing something early in a pandemic, late in the pandemic, and then whether you're looking backwards in the time at the top or forwards in time at the bottom, then the uncertainty is always greatest if you're doing something early on with limited data or if you're attempting to say anything about the future and is always better if you have a lot more data and are looking back at the past. After that little introduction, I'll, I'll, I'll be more concrete and, and just talk about some work we've done on variants and vaccines. Um, first of all, just the point that I mean, modeling this pandemic has got a lot harder over time. Whilst the models have got better, our surveillance data has got a lot better. It is still much easier to model the spread of a new virus in a population with very limited immunity. And as immunity built up in the population, particularly true of the UK, um, things got more difficult. Then we got new variants which, with different epidemiological characteristics. And then of course we introduced vaccination and whilst I want to come on to vaccine effectiveness, we have estimates of vaccine effectiveness. They're not perfect estimates. So prediction is always hard and is made harder by all of those things, but it's also hard because we cannot anticipate the precise impact of policies in advance because frankly, at least in the UK, the government has never introduced quite the same policy twice uh, in a row. And then population behavior has changed over the course of the pandemic. So just to give an illustration of how, I mean, how do we assess things like the um, relative transmissibility of a new variant? And this is data from different English regions. So for thankfully for both the alpha variant and the delta variant, and then the Omicron variant, they have differed in whether PCR tests test positive on one protein, the spike protein. And the UK relies on a a particular assay which tests three different genes, including the spike protein, for about a third of the PCR testing it does. And so the orange curve is overall test, you know, test positive people over time, cases over time. And then for a subset, the thinner lines for each of these regions represent um, people who are positive overall for uh, coronavirus, but test negative on the spike protein. And then blue uh, at the bottom is uh, testing positive. And this is going back in time to 2020, beginning of 2021. So, and looking at the introduction, well, the, the growth of the alpha variant, which almost certainly originated in the UK. The, the, the pink areas represent times where the country was in lockdown. Though, albeit those two lockdowns were different, schools were open in the first one, which was the second lockdown in England, and then uh, closed in, in, in uh, the January third lockdown. And what we saw in that second lockdown in November is growth of the alpha variant in, in nearly every area, despite the lockdown in being in place, but decline of the old wild type variant. And seeing that in multiple locations, when one, even if the generation time, the serial interval is different, having one variant go down and the other go up is a clear signifier of, of increased transmissibility. And that allowed us to estimate that level of increased transmissibility. And the estimates vary depending on, on what serial interval you assume, but we estimated off the order at the time of between 50 and 80%, probably closer to 50 than 80. Um, and then we had exactly the same situation occur, albeit on a more complex background, um, with the Delta variant coming into the UK. Um, we Again, with a Whilst it didn't originate in the UK, we were the most heavily seeded country in Europe because of historical ties to India. Um, and so we had heavy seeding in, in late April. 
and you see the delta variant rise. This is now plotted on a logarithmic scale, so it's kind of straight line increasing across multiple regions. Um, it was introduced at a time where the UK was still in partial lockdown. The alpha variant was declining, partly or well, largely because of the introduction of vaccination, but the delta variant increased, and that allows you to estimate again the relative transmission advantage, um, albeit, on, as I say, on a more complex background. And the more complex background is, is vaccines, which are clearly the long-term solution to the, albeit an imperfect solution, not a magic bullet, but clearly are the long-term solution to the pandemic. And the reason I say um, it, it complicated the background, and I, I haven't shown both sets of estimates, and we, along with uh, it's a paper which has been internally in preparation, but delayed by Omicron now, but um, we've undertaken this full population cohort analysis, similar to some analysis undertaken in Israel of, of vaccine effectiveness against multiple endpoints, um, namely death, hospitalization, symptomatic cases, both in the alpha era, which I'm not showing, but in the delta era. And so this shows for the different two dominant vaccines used in the UK uh, for the first, for the um, second dose only I'm showing here, the, the booster boosts it up much higher, but I'm showing that how vaccine effectiveness is, has decayed over time as a function of how many weeks have passed since the second dose. Important to note is for alpha, the bottom curve was much higher. Um, so Delta was a partial immune escape variant, whilst protection against severe disease, hospitalization, death was, as you can see from these graphs, largely preserved, um, kept above, certainly for death, above 90% at all of those time points. Against symptomatic disease, particularly for the AstraZeneca vaccine, it was severely com compromised. And now it has been compromised uh, further by Omicron. So we do a lot of real-time modeling. I've already shown you some of the papers using those sort of estimates, both of relative transmission advantage, but also vaccine effectiveness to inform UK government policy. One of the major things we've done this year is, is to look at that exact trade-off between the rollout of vaccines and how much that allows you to lift social distancing measures and still have manageable levels of hospital bed occupancy. This shows some illustrative, um, and the grant actually not in press in the Lancet, it's out in the Lancet, some illustrative scenarios. The UK government, we have a, a right of centre government which believes in individual liberty. They're mostly concerned with relaxing measures as soon as they can without overwhelming our health system. And so, I mean, they adopted measures akin to that sort of red curve you can see um, in, uh, in, on, on the graphs in front of you. So where next? I'm just saving a little bit of time for um, talking about uh, Omicron. We have seen a sudden spike in, in infections, and this is the UK government dashboard, public available each day. If you look at the bottom left there, you'll see case numbers have now risen per day to the highest level they've ever been in the UK, um, over uh, 90,000 um, cases per day. And that is largely down to the arrival of the Omicron variant. If we look at its frequency among all cases um, of coronavirus, it has gone up exponentially, incredibly fast. In the first, I mean, period, you know, basically a doubling time of two days, it's slowed a little bit now, um, but certainly under three days. This is two different measures of, of its, its the proportion of all coronavirus cases in the UK, which are Omicron. One is from VAM means variant testing, it's genotype testing, it's more reliable. The second is from that spike protein testing, and a third of PCR tests, more numerous, but um, slightly less reliable, but they basically show a very similar picture of rise. And now we're above, um, um, from, from the representative point of view of the, uh, the SGTF, the, the spike testing is, is more reliable, but at this point in time, this data goes back a few days, we're above half of, of all of cases in the UK being, being um, Omicron, we estimate. We have, fortunately, a very detailed, I mean, um, data set to analyze. We have, as well as just this aggregate numbers I just showed you, we have a line list of every single individual who's tested positive with any coronavirus during the whole pandemic. 
linked to their vaccination status, linked to their hospital records and linked to whether they died or not. And that allows for very detailed analysis, particularly at times like these, of the um, emergent properties of new variants. And, and this is what I'm showing you here. This is just impact on vaccine effectiveness. And it's a complicated table, but basically um, the different rows show different vaccination status. So AZ D1 less than 30, 21 represents people who've had a first dose of AstraZeneca, nothing else in the less than 21 days from that first dose, going all the way down to, for instance, PFD3 14 plus, which are people with Pfizer, post dose three, they've had a booster dose and they're more than 14 days out from that booster dose. And what we can do very quickly is ask, what are the predictors of somebody being an Omicron case versus a Delta case, controlling for lots of other demographic variables? And if, and that's represented through a hazard ratio, if people are more likely to be Omicron than Delta, given they are a case, um, if they're vaccinated, it indicates that vaccines are less effective against Omicron than Delta. And so we can use these relative risks or hazard ratios as they're co called to estimate vaccine effectiveness. We know to quite a degree of precision vaccine effectiveness against Delta. And here, I mean, there are multiple different estimates. I'm actually showing the estimates from the UK Health Security Agency, but applying the scaling factors, we can estimate then the vaccine effectiveness against Omicron. And what we see is a dramatic drop in, um, in those two eff effectiveness for AstraZeneca down to basically zero. But even for, if you've had two doses of Pfizer, um, if you're more than 14 day, well, certainly of the order of four or five months out, which is what we're talking about for most of the population, down to no more than about 20%. And if you use different estimates for the effectiveness, vaccine effectiveness against Delta down to basically zero. The good news from this is that if people are, are only a month or two out from their booster dose, they still have a vaccine effectiveness of somewhere depends on, again, which estimates you use for Delta, but we think somewhere between about 55 and 80% protection. And I should say this is against mild symptomatic disease. Um, the other thing which is important, particularly in context like the UK, where we've been running the epidemic quite hot for several months, and so we estimate now that something over a third of the population has been infected with, with um, coronavirus, is we estimate that somewhere between a five and six fold increase in the risk of reinfection with Omicron compared with earlier variants. So if you've had a previous coronavirus infection, um, in the past, we had estimates of, of how much that protected you against reinfection of the order of about 85% from a cohort study in the UK after about six months. That's probably gone down to, I mean, close to 0%. So Omicron seems to escape you know, natural immunity to a high degree in terms of reinfection, but probably not in terms of severe disease. Um, and whilst we will have later this week the more definitive estimates of the protection people have against severe disease with Omicron after being vaccinated, this is an extrapolation using modeling of the relationship between antibody titers and what these graphs show. First of all, is the top row is Delta, the bottom row is Omicron. The left-hand side shows what are called neutralizing antibody titers, which are how many, you know, the level of antibodies in your blood against Delta. And you see somebody who's had a first dose right on the left, and then they get the second dose, the antibodies go higher, and then they get a third dose, the antibodies go even higher. Um, and this is for people vaccinated with Pfizer. And we fitted this model, which was first developed by David Curry, published in Nature Medicine, to vaccine effectiveness data. And you can see those blue points there on the graph in the middle. This is vaccine effect efficacy against mild disease. Um, model fits reasonably well. I should say the, the lines around that represent individual level heterogeneity in predicted antibody titers. There's a lot of variation from person to person. So the black lines represent the median, close to the mean. And then 
Against severe disease, we think protection is much more, which is on the right hand side, is much more protected, much more preserved. And so those some of those quite low numbers against delta in the blue points and the black curve, top row in the middle, translate into still much higher levels of protection, even many days out from your second dose and never mind third dose uh, against severe disease. And then on the bottom row, you see what's happened with Omicron. Omicron has effectively made antibodies that were less effective, reduced people's neutralizing antibody titer, and that has, has had a, we think, a major impact on vaccine effectiveness against um, mild disease, um, so that if you're four or five months out, it's really quite low. But we think, at least in the short term, for people who have been boosted, it will preserve vaccine effectiveness against severe disease at about the 80 to 90 percent level, though we will need to think about boosting again quite quickly. Uh, Neil, can we? Um... Yeah. And then um, finally, we've translated these into kind of modeling projections. And so um, and they span a wide range of uncertainty at the current time. The, the one circled, this is predicted daily hospitalizations in the UK. They range from anything from of the order of 3,000 hospitalizations today, which is less than the alpha peak we saw a year ago, to much, much worse. And this is what we are trying to resolve. And that is it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we've seen a very uh, uh, clear well, display of the challenges faced uh, by uh, all of you in trying to help uh, <laughs> the decision making. Can I ask all the panelists to switch on their camera so we can uh, uh, get some questions out? Um, so let me start um, uh, with, uh, well, a question for Neil. Um, that was in the in the Q and A. Uh, so uh, there was a question of, about whether or not it, it is possible for you to, or for you and for Yako, I think, to include uh, things like humidity, temperature, uh, the the potential for micro vaccination through low dose exposures, and the super spreading events uh, into your modeling. I would say, please. <laughs> So we have looked at seasonality a little. I mean, probably is there, but it's not a huge effect. Um, it's quite hard to discern given, given we are in a pandemic and different policies have been imposed in different regions. But for, for most of our modeling, we do include it. I mean, the issue of microdosing or let's say boosting of immunity upon exposure is an interesting one. Um, difficult to get good data on, but it is something we have considered. Um, and we've done a little bit of modeling of it, but it's not within our um, kind of default modeling scenario. Um, maybe I'll let Yakir respond. Okay, um, I can add to that. Like we have um, like incorporated like some uh, elements into the model. Uh, and I think the one that was left open is still super spreading. I think sometimes um, like for so model predictions at a national level that's uh, implicitly included, um, like in most of the projections, uh, but sometimes for like smaller scale studies, you want to include it explicitly. So that depends a little bit on the setting, but I think it's, yeah, whenever it's needed, it's uh, very often included into modeling as well. And um, uh, I think like each of these, new elements comes with a kind of question for the data to um, back it up. I think that's what Neil was answering for the microdosing, but also for super spreading, kind of we need to know kind of the, um, yeah, the, the like uh, what kind of probability for what, how large a number of cases can be infected in by one uh, person or, or in one event. And there's, uh, yeah, we have a little bit of data, but uh, it's still very hard to get the data right. And also, um, yeah, just coming back to the humidity and temperature, like we do include it in our models. It explains a kind of seasonal effect we see. And for that reason, we expect to do it easier or efficient in winter as compared to summer. 
but we don't know if it's um, like a cause or just a correlate of something, a confounding factor. We just know that in winter, in general, it, it goes better, but it might be because people are inside more. <clears throat> and uh, it happens to coincide with the annual pattern in absolute humidity. So that's um, how we deal with these uh, observables. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe a question for Michael. Um, I think this, this issue of the timing of boosters is becoming critical as we now look, well, seeing uh, Omicron and seeing uh, Neil's work have come to realize. So um, what, what are you looking at in Israel? Because your time since booster has been a while. Um, are you gonna re-booster? So it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the eligibility criteria um, allow you to get boosted six months after your second dose. Um, so the boosting started around late July. So we, we, we get, we're getting close to the, to the six months, uh, the six months period. Um, there are, there are some, um, early calls for a further dose at the moment restricted to vulnerable individuals, individuals with comorbidities, um, elderly people, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, uh, you know, I think it's likely to become policy in the, in the coming weeks. There's nothing decided, but that's, that's the, the direction of travel. We haven't seen, um, you know, a lot of breakthrough infection, infections in, in people who were boosted within, within the last six months. What we also see, um, we just, I'm just, we just, uh, we just put a preprint, um, is that the, the there is some benefit in terms of immunogenicity in delaying further boosters. You see higher antibody teeters, but we don't really know what that means. We don't know whether that translates to actual further clinical correction. So I think, I think we're still some time away from determining. Um, you know, the optimal schedule for boosting, how often and who, et cetera. I think at the moment, because of the lack of data, certainly in Israel, the, you know, the, 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 the government approach at the moment is one of precautionary principle based, you know, using in the absence of data, using being overcautious rather than, rather than the other way around. And there may be... Uh... As another question is around the the family sizes. Um, uh, do you have an idea how much uh, immunity from from natural infections you may already be looking yeah. at, and, and whether that is is part of the equation? So it's an interesting question. There is a study. There's actually a UK study from uh, from the London School of Hygiene that looked at um, seroprevalence in the ultra orthodox community in London and similar studies here in Israel. And it's certainly very different in Israel according to what community you look at. Um, I can't remember the figure, but it's, it was very high, um, partly because I, I think it was around, around 50, more than 50 to 60% in that community. And that was a while ago um, for two reasons. The first one is, uh, you know, this is a community that lives in crowded uh, and environments with very large household sizes. The second one is, um, this is also the, the community that is the least vaccinated and a very young community. You know, the, the, the average age is, is like late teens. There's more than 50% of the, the, the community that's less than 18. So there was this, this belief that, um, you know, COVID is really not, a, it's not so much, it, it wasn't so much anti-vaccination in the sense that believing conspiracy theories, et cetera, but it's more, it was more a belief that um, COVID was not, um, a serious disease for them. And therefore there was actually deliberate um, organized at the community level attempts to get massively infected in order to create herd immunity in these communities. So you actually end up with very high level of, uh, of natural infection. And you've seen, you know, the, the proportion of cases, it, it, the, the community represents 10 to 12% of the population in Israel and about 35% of the cases. Michael, also a question from me. You showed us a striking difference between Israel and, and UK and the Netherlands when it comes to the deaths, the numbers of people dying in the first wave. 
which mainly were elderly. And you alluded that to the difference between Israel and the Netherlands with the Netherlands having many people living in nursing homes and Israel, they take care of the elderly. But that's what they also do in Italy. And it was one of the questions. How then would you see the high death rate in Italy uh, as opposed to, uh, to what happened in Israel? So the, I think it's a combination of factors, but the, the age distribution is very different. It, Italy is one of the oldest countries in Europe. Um, the population of Israel is, is very young. There's only, I think, 10 to 12% of the population that's over the age of 65 in the first place. So I think if you combine the relatively small proportion of individuals in this age group combined with the fact that, um, you know, there's not that many opportunities for person-to-person -person transmission within that age group, um, you know, I think that's, that's a plausible explanation for the lack of a, a, a mortality peak. Okay. Thank you. And a question to Jaco that came along. Um, why does it take two weeks before we know what the R, the effective R value was two weeks ago? Uh, it takes two weeks, uh, principally, because that's um, due to the natural cycle of uh, infection. Uh, and before we have observations in, there was also like one um, question, <clears throat> I think, in the panel that asked, like, why? Uh, do we always, um, we, we seem to be running behind uh, the reality or behind the facts. But I think basically whenever an event happens, uh, an infection event happens, we have to wait for um, that person to become <coughs> symptomatic, go to, um, uh, uh, go to get tested for the testing data to come in. Then we need to wait for this person also to infect others for those others to get infected and get testing results in. And only then we can calculate how many people have been infected. And that total um, in total takes 14 days. And of course we can manipulate it a little bit by saying like, well, we calculate exactly the same variable but we base it on the time of symptom onset of the uh, infectees rather than the infector. And we would have gained a little bit, but uh, like we cannot be much faster than the data comes in. And that's basically why we have to deal with the 14 days. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, around uh, the, the combination of different vaccines. Neil, uh, addressed to you, uh, do you have any information uh, uh, and, and is that factored into the, uh, the uh, modeling estimates? So it's uh, looking at switch protocols where you have a primary. I think I just answered it online, actually, to save time. Ah, OK, but, um, I, but think... I mean, the simple answer is we don't have a lot on mixing primary courses, but there is data on boosters. I mean, say AZ followed by Pfizer or Pfizer followed by Moderna. They tend to suggest that it doesn't really, as long as, it, as it's an mRNA booster, it doesn't really matter what your primary course was and you get similar levels of effectiveness after, after the booster dose. Um, okay, maybe a, a second question. Um, uh, that certainly has been a big debate in our country is, um, are, uh, how do you look at uh, um, phase, uh, or factoring in economical impact? Um, of course, that's of current. I'm going to be controversial and say I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I mean, we actually are more seriously. I mean, my colleague, uh, Katerina Hauck, who's a health economist, has worked with a bunch of macroeconomists, and we have a model which models different industry sectors and economically, let's say, optimized social distancing but fundamentally i mean i think we are epidemiologists we model the epidemiology of the epidemic i i think far too much has been spoken about the supposed trade-off between let's say the economy and public health and the evidence actually points to the fact that the countries which have maintained control over covid better and have minimized deaths have also done better economically As we come to an end of the, the, the session, and one question to each of you, after you have a well-deserved night of sleep and you wake up tomorrow morning, which of the parameters that you use would you like to know tomorrow morning with 100% certainty? <laughs> 
let others answer first. Mm, yes, Michael. Uh, I'm 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 not a modeler, so I don't I, I don't have uh, I don't have parameters to put in models. But what I think one of the key questions, and we're starting to have answers, is is the effectiveness uh, of of the, of vaccine schedules around Omicron because that will completely change. You know, are we back to square one, or are we able to um, are we going to be able to withhold uh, or to sorry to to sort of ride through the the Omicron wave? Okay, Jaco, now you know this, so you can't answer the same. Uh, well, in addition to what Michael just uh, said, I would also like to know the, um, like when uh, the pandemic waves uh, kind of end and normalize. I mean, for private reasons, I would be very interested in knowing when it stops, but I'm very curious how this whole pandemic, how it evolves over time, whether it will become something like a new influenza or not. And final word to Neil. Well, I mean, I, I spent all weekend and, and today working on a, a preprint on um, the severity of Omicron and vaccine effectiveness against severe disease. So that's rather obsessing my thoughts. I tend to agree with Yako. It would be nice to have us. I think there are some key unknowns um, <coughs> around the, the potentially the role of T cells or the. We, let me start again. We know that antibody titer is a very good correlative protection against infection. We don't know whether protection against severe disease, which is what we care about most, is pre uh, preserved for a much longer time or hits the minimum floor. That will make a fundamental difference to long-term vaccination strategies. Um, and yeah, I would like to know that because uh, at the moment we've only followed people six, eight months out and so we just don't know the answer whether it carries on decaying, but it will determine you know, how often we have to vaccinate in the future. Thank you. And thank you all. This uh, the last one where cellular immunity hits the floor. Sounds like a nice title for a movie, but um, we have to deal with this uh, question for the coming months. I would like to thank all of you, all three speakers for uh, excellent presentations. Uh, the audience for raising so many questions that will keep us working, answering them for some time after the meeting. Um, thank you, KNW, for organizing this. Thank you, Mayon, for sharing this. And then uh, all the best and uh, looking forward to see you again on the next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you.